Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Before we begin today's episode, I would like to thank Professor Charles Ingram from Purdue University. I am extremely grateful for his help with researching the pragmatic sanction of 1713, which this episode is about. Professor Ingram himself wrote the article that I'm using as the main source regarding the pragmatic sanction, and I could not be happier with the information I received from his writing. I am also amazed by the sudden amount of listeners from India. I seriously think it is so cool that the audience of my podcast is truly an international crowd. A message specifically for listeners from India is that your history is so rich and completely undervalued. The Mughal Empire alone deserves its own podcast, and let alone the entire history of India. But don't think I forgot about Bangladesh, because there is also a listener from Bangladesh, which is also so amazing. So thank you all for caring about this biography series about Frederick the Great. It means so much to me that you are all listening to this. Also, if you want to, rate my podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen from, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Last episode, we talked about the political testament of Frederick Wilhelm and how he wanted a future ruler of Prussia to act and behave exactly like himself. Anyway, we haven't talked about the Habsburgs for a while, so let's talk about them, shall we? The last time we left off with the grand, nar- the grand narrative of European politics uh, that involved the Habsburgs was the Spanish Succession War. But first, let us go into a little bit of detail regarding the Great Turkish War, which preceded the War of Spanish Succession. In 1683, when Prince Eugene of Savoy was just 20 years old, the Ottoman Empire attacked the Habsburgs at the very heart of their empire, Vienna. The Janissaries surrounded the beating heart of the Habsburg Empire from the middle of summer until September 12th. During that time, the citizens of Vienna, who were utterly outnumbered by the Turks, mounted their defense. They dealt with starvation, disease, and the threat of explosive mines and tunnels under the city. Then finally, after numerous delays, the Imperial Army arrived at Vienna as a coalition of different German states and the Poles, led by King Jan Sobieski. This Polish detachment had the world-renowned Winged Hussars, which was a cavalry force that wore metal eagle wings on their backs and had a huge clanking sound whenever they rode their horses. This shrieking of metal, as well as their appearance alone, was to strike fear into the very souls of the enemy. The upcoming battle was a smashing success for the Habsburg coalition, and they still sing the praises of the winged hussars. However, if you thought the end of this particular battle meant total victory for the Habsburg coalition and the Turkish Empire would spontaneously combust, you are utterly incorrect. It was called the Great Turkish War for a reason. It lasted a very long time. Its effects in Central Europe still live with us today, plus a ton of people died. I won't go into every single battle, but needless to say, it was a long, hard fight that led to the rise of Prince Eugene of Savoy and the Treaty of Karlovitz. Here's what A. Mitchell's book, The Grand Strategy of the Habsburg Empire, has to say about the peace terms. Under the terms of the Treaty of Karlovitz, The monarchy gained nearly 60,000 square miles of land, effectively doubling the size of the empire. The new territories stretched to the Sava River in the south and the Carpathians in the east, bringing Slavonia, Croatia, and most of Hungary, including Transylvania but without Banat, under Habsburg rule. These peace terms finally allowed the Habsburgs to have security in the south against the Ottomans. However, Trouble was brewing in the Iberian Peninsula when the final Habsburg king of Spain, Charles II, died. Then, obviously, the War of Spanish Succession happened. You can check out episode 7 to get a refresher on what happened on a grander scale during that war. See, the future emperor Charles VI was the Habsburg candidate for the crown of Spain after Charles II of Spain died. 
In September of 1703, two years after the War of Spanish Succession began, Charles ceded Milan, which was previously a Spanish Habsburg territory in Italy, and he ceded it to the Austrian Habsburg branch. Charles also signed the, and make sure to brace your hearts for my horrible Latin pronunciation, Pactum Mutue Sexicianus. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Here's what Professor Ingro has to say about this particular pactum. He writes, as with this pragmatic succession, the pactum stipulated that Austrian lands should proceed without partition by right of primogeniture. In keeping with this provision, it stressed that Charles and his heirs should never seek to revise succession agreement or to require any Austrian possessions under any pretext. This pact between the Habsburg princes made sure that the Habsburg territories would not be split up like Charlemagne's empire was split up among his grandsons due to succession laws. Whereas Charlemagne's empire was split into three bordering sections, Middle Francia, East Francia, and West Francia, the Habsburg family branches were split between the Spanish and the Austrian branches, which were fairly distant from one another. After all, it takes 2,000 385 kilometers to get from Vienna to Madrid on modern roads today. Think about how slow communications were back then. Also, consider how there is one major obstacle between these two branches. Louis XIV's France. Louis XIV was about on par with the Turks as far as existential threats go for the Habsburg monarchy. The vast distance between the two branches was one of the reasons why this pact was signed. The pactum said, in basic terms, Charles, don't you ever go after our Austrian lands? And Charles agreed. After this pact was signed among the Habsburgs, Charles traveled to Spain where he would attempt to take it in the name of the Habsburgs. In 1703, when the pactum was signed, Leopold I of Austria was still the Holy Roman Emperor. Louis, uh, Leopold conceived a whopping 16 children with three wives, and due to various factors, one of them, of course, being the horrible inbreeding, only two of his sons managed to live to adulthood. These sons' names were Joseph and Charles. Charles is the guy who wants to take back Spain for the Habsburgs, and Joseph, the older son, will become Joseph I, the Holy Roman Emperor, in 1705. Joseph was jealous of his brother, partially because Charles was their father's favorite. One observer of Joseph remarked, quote, His hatred against his good-natured and pious brother grows daily and will, it is feared, never be extinguished, end quote. This is one of the reasons why there was conflict when, in 1707, the Austrian army occupied Milan. This was inter-Habsburg conflict at its highest. Charles agreed to lose Milan. However, since treaties were not public things in those days, that fact was, as of yet, unknown to the Spanish. In order to keep up the act, Charles would send all major decrees to Vienna so that Joseph could approve them. So, we have Archduke Charles playing Pinocchio to Emperor Joseph. He couldn't even use Milan as a tax base to raise soldiers against the Habsburg's enemies. Even when he did, his brother Joseph ended up basically scolding him like Charles was a schoolboy. Charles was very iffy on the subject of Milan, but boy did he sweat when the Austrian army took over Naples. And... Do you want to know what Charles' official excuse for why uh, Joseph took over in Naples, even though it was clearly a territory that Charles owned? Joseph wrote to his brother that Charles did not have, quote, have sufficient ability or experience to discharge the important and extensive offices of the Spanish monarchy. Wow. Joseph, why are you being such a jerk to, jerk to your bro? I mean, he's just trying to take over the Spanish crown, and you just told him he's not worthy of the Spanish crown. Jeez. 
One of Joseph's reasons for tension against his brother is that Charles had still not conquered Spain. By 1709, the war had cost a ton of blood and treasure and had lasted for nine, for eight long and disastrous years. Charles still seems no closer to the crown of Spain than he did at the beginning of the war. And the largest battle on early modern European soil until Borodino happened at the Battle of Malplaquet. However, the final nail in the coffin of Charles's ambitions in Spain was the death of his brother in April 1711. Joseph had only lived to be seven, uh, to be 32 years old. Charles would have to inherit a bloody war against the French, no prospects in Spain, a major revolt in Hungary, and skyrocketing debts that occur during major wars. Yikes. This now leads us to the, to the pragmatic sanction of 1713. Why do we care about this Habsburg drama? Well, essentially, the history of Prussia and the Frederick the Great is also the story of Maria Theresa and the Habsburgs. She will be the dance partner of Frederick the Great and the grand tango of European politics that will lead to three major conflicts for one single Habsburg province. Why did a woman become the head of the Habsburg family? Why was she so defensive about one puny province? These are the questions that the pragmatic sanction of 1713 answers. According to the terms of the pactum that was signed in 1703, the two daughters of Joseph should be the heirs to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. However, even though the pactum stated that none of the terms could be altered, Charles still ended up altering the succession laws with the pragmatic sanction of 1713. This altered succession allowed the possibility for female succession if Charles were to have children. Here's what Professor Ingrell had to say about Charles altering the succession laws. Clearly personal rather than legal considerations had influenced him. If he stressed the pragmatic sanctions debt to the pactum, it was to bolster the legitimacy of the sanction as a whole. Thus, by association of that single passage, was, which was not compatible with the pactum. So clearly, this was a final insult to his brother so that Joseph's daughter would not be the first in line. However, he could, he could have chosen a better time to act petty than during a global scale war. Just saying. According to Professor Ingrau's article on the Pragmatic Sanction, in 1713, the Habsburg monarchy needed three things, allies, peace, and an air of unquestioned, of unquestioned legitimacy. With the terms of the pactum, Maria Josepha, the daughter of Joseph, had the strongest claim to the throne. But the Pragmatic Sanction muddied up these waters when Charles declared that if he were to have any female children, they would be the heir to the Habsburgs. Another factor beyond legitimacy is the factor of alliance through marriage. Two important counterweights to the growing power of Prussia in the Holy Roman Empire are Saxony and Bavaria. These duchies were both electorates and therefore helped decided who would be elected emperor. If Maria Joseva could be married off to a Wittelsbach or a Wetten, the royal houses of Bavaria and Saxony, then alliances could be made with them. Considering that the ruler of Saxony also ruled Poland, Austria would secure both their northern and eastern frontiers. But with the pragmatic sanction and the birth of Maria Theresa in 1717, these possible alliances were more out of the cards. However, there was another factor that made the pragmatic sanction one of the most important documents in early modern Austrian history. The pragmatic sanction integrated all of the Habsburg territories together. So there would be no more competition between Spanish or Austrian Habsburg branches. No, there would be a single Habsburg domain in Europe. This dotted the map from what is today Belgium to Northern Italy, the Austrian heartland, 
and into the Balkans, with Hungary being reintegrated into the Habsburg Empire after Rakoci's War of Independence. Everywhere from Budapest to Brussels to Breslau would be united under the double-headed eagle of the Habsburgs. There was finally unity within the Habsburg lands, but do not think this means the same as the unity of one nation. These domains spoke different languages, practiced different religions, and all in all were completely different ethnicities. The Habsburg Empire was even more diverse than Yugoslavia once was. The idea of nationalism was to be born out of the fires of the French Revolution, which is sadly beyond the scope of this podcast. So great. The Habsburgs can now have females inherit the throne, and legally the Habsburg lands are all connected. Why does this matter to the life and times of Frederick the Great, you may ask? Well, if you were to look at a map of Central Europe in 1740, you will see that there is a small border between Prussia and the Habsburg lands. This borderland, called Silesia, will be the most important battleground in our story for the foreseeable future. Charles VI, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, will try to get all of Europe to recognize the pragmatic sanction and Maria Theresa's claim to succeed him. But when Charles dies in 1740, a lot of things will happen that we will talk about at a future date involving Frederick the Great and the Habsburgs. It will truly be the showdown of the century. Thank you all for listening to this podcast of mine. I seriously cannot believe the support I'm getting from you all. Now to conclude in the most Austrian way that I can, when I say, Auf Wiedersehen.